On this episode of What's Going On With Shipping, why the supply chain bottleneck shifted to the East and Gulf Coast ports. Hi, I'm your host, Sal McCoglano. Welcome to this episode of What's Going On With Shipping. If you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Well, the Wall Street Journal just came out with a video that I thought deserved a little bit of attention. Their video, How Supply Chain Bottlenecks Shifted to the East and Gulf Coast Ports, is a great video. It's about four and a half minutes long, but it misses several key points. And more importantly, it's talking about the how, but not the why. So I thought I'd take that video, break it down, and add some information that really rounds out what the Wall Street Journal was reporting on. Before we do so, if you're new to the channel, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. All right, let's jump over to the Wall Street Journal video. Savannah in Georgia, the second largest port on the East Coast. This map shows ship locations, tracked by the company Marine Traffic. On August 19th, there was a backup of about 30 container ships. Similar backlogs have formed at the ports in New York and Houston. This is important because it makes life difficult for businesses, particularly small businesses. And it's also important because it helps to keep the cost of shipping goods high, which contributes to inflation. So how did this backlog happen? And what's being done to relieve the congestion? So this backlog has been going on for quite a long time. This is not new. This is an extension of the backlog that was off LA and Long Beach, it has just migrated. You still have over a dozen ships waiting to get in LA and Long Beach, but now you see it manifesting itself on the East and Gulf Coast ports. To understand what's happening today on the East and Gulf Coasts, you have to go all the way back to the beginning of the pandemic when there was first a massive decrease in the number of goods moving around the world. And then so I'm going to take a second here and uh, just say, well, you got to go back even further than that. If you just go back to COVID, COVID was a trigger for the global phenomenon that happens. However, there were underlying issues that were impacting the transportation, particularly the ocean global transportation system, long before we got to COVID. So one of the first things that you have to discuss if you're going to talk about this is the consolidation of the ocean transportation companies, the big container liners, Maersk, Mediterranean Shipping, uh, Hamburg, uh, excuse me, Hop Hog Lloyd, Yang Min, CMA, CGM, Costco, all those companies, if you go back to 2008, just go back to when the Great Recession took place. 15 years ago, what you saw was the top 50, the top 10 companies controlled 50% of the ocean containers moving around the world. So you had ocean containers moving around. Those top 10 companies controlled 50%. Today, the top 10 companies control 85%. And nine of those 10 companies are in three big alliances, the 2M, the Alliance, and the Ocean Alliance. That is a much different situation than we had, which means that ocean shipping companies can pool resources together, they share routes, and they have greater control over more ocean traffic than ever before. The other element is the growth in size of the vessels. If you go back to 2006, this is a uh, chart that's done over at Port uh, Economics Management and Policy. Uh, this is a great chart. Go ahead and magnify this up and give you a little better view. There you go. This chart shows you the size of ocean container ships and how they have increased in size. If you go back to 2006, when you see the introduction of the E-Class, the Maersk E-Class, it literally jumps jumps from about 10,000 TEUs up to 15,000 TEUs. In other words, you increase the carrying capacity of some of these large container ships by 50%, which is a tremendous growth that you have. By the time you get into 2013, you have the introduction of the triple E class. That's 18,000 TEU. A few years later, you're up into 20,000 TEUs. Now you have ships like Ever A Lot, which is at over 24,000. TEU, which meant when the Great Recession hit in 2008, you had greater control of ocean shipping in the hands of fewer companies, and they had larger vessels. And when the ocean shipping slowed down in the 2010s, what they did, the ocean shipping companies did, was they packed less cargo on their ships and they slowed down. So that when COVID hit in 2019, now all of a sudden the ships can put the hammer down on the gas. They can increase their speed across, but more importantly, there was capacity. There was room to put more stuff on the boats. And that was a big change that is not really mentioned so much in this video by the Wall Street Journal. 
then an enormous increase of flood of imports that really hasn't stopped for the last two years. The worst bottlenecks at U.S. ports have been concentrated at the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach in Southern California, where earlier this year there was a backup of more than 100 container ships. This year, cargo growth has slowed at the Southern California ports. Okay, I, I'm going to call BS on that comment right there because we just saw the report from the executive director at the Port of L.A., Gene Sirocco, and I got a video on it that you can go watch, and I'll have the link uh, in the show notes and up above here, where, first off, the five out of seven months this year of 2022 have been record months for the Port of L.A. They are right now at the end of July, basically exactly where they were last year in terms of containers handling in the port of Los Angeles. So it's not that things have slowed down by any means. What we've seen is a shift in what is coming in. Again, we're dealing with that shift out of a COVID economy into a post-COVID economy, which means are people going back to work? Are they stay working from home? What does that mean? I don't know, but we better ship a whole crap load of stuff. And that's what we're seeing. Ports are at huge, massive levels. But what's happening in the port of LA and Long Beach is this, is number one, you're seeing the dimin diminishing of the small container lines that were opportunistic. In other words, companies like SM Lines, CU Lines, Express Feeders, which would load a ship, a small little feeder ship out from Asia, loaded full of containers because they can make a huge amount of money on the spot rates coming across the Pacific, show up off LA and Long Beach and jam things up because they weren't the regularly scheduled vessels coming in. We are still seeing record rates coming into LA and Long Beach right now. So when they're saying they're, they're catching their breath during this import lull, it's not exactly true. March was a booming year, a booming month for LA and Long Beach. Usually March is the slowest month, but they were just under 2021 this past March. So again, I, I don't think this is exactly accurate. The main U.S. gateway for goods imported from Asia, but volumes headed into the country through the East and Gulf Coasts have kept rising. So retailers and manufacturers had a really, really difficult time in 2021 getting all of the goods and the widgets that they needed in order to get products to the stores. They were so concerned at the start of this year that they would see similar delays to the ones that they saw last year that they both ordered earlier than they normally would, and they ordered more than they normally would. And because we- Okay, that is exactly accurate. So one of the things that we saw very early on in Q1, Q2 is, and we knew this was gonna happen, was people were gonna upfront their orders. They were gonna upfront orders and try to beat the, the, the rush at the end of the year into LA and Long Beach. The other issue they had is LA and Long Beach had a difficult time getting the containers out of the yards, out of the terminals, into the interior. Understand most ocean shipping containers, when they arrive in LA and Long Beach, they go one of two places. They go to warehouses and distribution centers close to LA and Long Beach, into you know the Alameda Corridor, uh, to, to uh, uh, the Inland Empire, uh, or they get on rail and they go cross country because a lot of the freight that goes into Southern California doesn't stay in Southern California. A lot of it goes cross country. And because class one railroads were really cheap, really affordable, and the fact that LA and Long Beach were advertising like crazy to bring containers into their ports, everybody just fed into their existing systems. Understand, it's not a process of just rerouting a ship. It's not just, well, instead of going to LA, I'll go to the East Coast. You have to have the inland distribution system set up to handle that. But when everything backed up last year, shippers sat there and said, okay, I'm going to diffuse my network. I'm still gonna come to LA and Long Beach with a good chunk of cargo, but now I'm gonna start using some other vessels and some other routes. Retailers and manufacturers were worried about the ports on the West Coast. They diverted cargo to the ports at New York, Houston, and Savannah. Another reason that shippers are diverted. So that only happens for two reasons. Number one, understand when you go over here and you divert this way, and go back here for a second, how do you get ships that way? Well, two things happen. Number one, you have the ultra large container vessels, those monster container vessels over 18,000 TEU. Again, go back to the triple E's that were introduced by Maersk. You have those ultra large container vessels. Those ultra large container vessels don't come to the United States. They go from Asia to Europe. And what shippers began to do was pile goods into that route. They actually sailed from Asia, not eastward to the United States, but westward through the Malacca Straits, 
through the Suez Canal into the Mediterranean to European ports, transloaded out of European ports into other vessels that then came to the East Coast of the United States and provided container service. Or they went to these new Neo Panamax vessels, these vessels that were the maximum size that can go through the new lane of the Panama Canal, built back in 2016. They can go through the, that lane. And instead of 5,000 TEU ships that used to use the two old lanes of the, of the Panama Canal, this new lane allows 15 to 16,000 TEU vessels coming in. And now you can route. Now, this is a longer route. It's more expensive. But reliability, if you can get delivered into New York, Savannah, and Houston, number one, you're where the population is. The population is largely in the mid-Atlantic, New England, southeast, southwest portion of the United States. Yes, California has a huge, massive population, but that's still being fed by those trans-Pacific routes. All the rest is going on to these Neo-Panamax vessels and these ultra-large container vessels going through the Suez and Panama Canal as a diverting cargo from the West Coast this year is because there are labor talks between the union that represents about 22,000 dock workers at all of the ports along the West Coast. Historically, those talks have been contentious and there have been work slowdowns that have caused significant delays to cargo. During so that issue there of the labor negotiation, the 22,000 members of the ILWU, the International Longshoremen Warehouse Union, and then uh, a warehouse workers union, and then the PMA, the Pacific Maritime Association, that contract expired June 30th. And while they're still negotiating, everybody was worried about a slowdown. And even though the ILWU and the PMA will always talk about the fact that there's not going to be a strike, there was a slowdown in 2015 that everybody remembers who's ever freight shipped anything by freight across the Pacific. And so what has happened now is cargo has shifted and we're seeing it go through that Panama Canal and the route uh, on the ultra large container vessels. However, we should take a quick note here. There are problems with both those routes. One, Panama has an issue of water draft because of global warming and low lake levels on Gatun Lake. You can't always push the ultra large container, or excuse me, the uh, Neo Panamax vessels through the Panama Canal as fast as you like. Plus, as more vessels go through there, there are limits to the number of ships that can transit the Panama Canal. On the flip side, those containers going on the ultra-large container vessels have to go into these large ports in Europe to be transloaded. Ports like Felixstowe, Hamburg, Bremerhaven, which are all experiencing strikes right now. And that means we're going to see problems in the delivery of goods going on into the second quarter or second half of 2022. During the first five months of the year, the volume of loaded containers reaching the port of New York and New Jersey rose more than 12% from the comparable period of 2021, according to the Pacific Merchant Shipping Association. The inbound volume at Port Houston jumped 24% in that period. The impact of the congestion at these eastern Gulf Coast ports is being felt both by companies that are trying to import goods into the country as well as by exporters. Cargo handling term So you're seeing jumps in the major ports there, Charleston, Savannah, Norfolk, Boston, Jacksonville, they're all up. They're all up high numbers. And again, one of the problems we have in the United States is ports are run by municipalities and state governments, not by the national government, which means these ports are competing with each other. They're advertising, hey, come to my port. I want to make money. Come to my port. I can do this for you. I can promise you this. And they do. And we saw that earlier this year, 2022, with Charleston, when Charleston overpromised, and man, they got backlogged like you wouldn't believe. Savannah is, while it has a huge congestion off of it, is moving containers and it's moving them quite well. There's just the sheer volume of the number of ships. The issue isn't really the, the port or the numbers, it's getting them into the interior. This is the problem that LA and Long Beach had. They were servicing ships, but they just couldn't move the goods into the interior. Terminals at the ports are so full that they load and unload ships more slowly, causing backups at sea. On land, truckers can't return empty boxes, so their yards fill up with containers sitting atop trailers. The Port of New York and New Jersey is clogged with about 200,000 empty containers waiting to be picked up by ocean carriers. At the Houston port, import boxes are sitting an average of six to seven days, twice as long as usual. This isn't so. I, it drives me crazy. There's this issue of empty containers. Did a series of videos on this about the port of LA with the empty container. So a couple of things on the empty containers. 
So in 2008, when the global recession hit, the big ocean companies, uh, again, Maersk, Mediterranean Shipping, Evergreen, all these companies, they had to bleed assets because there was just a, a, a slowdown in freight. And so one of the assets they bled were containers. They got rid of, of their own containers. If you look at the ships today and you look at just images like this, you'll see some MSC, for example, it's an MSC ship. You'll see some MSC containers on here, but you see less and less of those containers with companies' names on them. More, more containers you see are just blank containers. That's because, number one, almost all the containers now are being built in China. The three largest uh, container manufacturers are all in China. But now you have container lessers. You have uh, companies like Triton that basically lease containers to uh, shippers and ocean carriers. And to tell you the truth, they could care less whether that container gets returned back to them or not, because they just charge you late fees. They charge you fees for it. It doesn't matter to them. The ocean carriers don't care because they're not their boxes either. So they don't care whether the boxes are loaded on or not loaded on. And what you wind up with is these empty containers clogging up the yards. This same thing happened in LA and Long Beach last year. And we saw a massive 90,000 containers at one point just clogged up LA. And it caused by backlogs because as you have all those empty containers in your yard, there is less maneuverability to move. It's like a full Tetris uh, uh, game. You, there's less maneuverability you can do. And you've got to clear those empty containers out. But again, what's the impetus to do it? You know, unless the fine is going to the ocean carrier to return those containers, then there's really no issue for them. But to tell you the truth, even if there's a fine for that container, it's probably more profitable for them to get back to Asia to pick up a loaded container because they're getting more freight rate for it now. We have got to figure out a way to incentivize the returning of these empty containers and get them off the terminals, which are clogging them up, something that needs to be done. So much a failure of the port and its operations. It's more an illustration of what happens when ports become so overwhelmed with cargo. At the end of the day, the ports only have a finite amount of space. But port officials say they are taking steps to try to relieve the congestion. Many of them have found additional land either within their own ports or outside of them where they can store extra containers and free up a little bit of space so that they can move boxes on and off ships more efficiently. Other this is the advantage of a port like Savannah in Houston, to tell you the truth, because Savannah, you know, once you get inside of Savannah, you're in, you know, empty farmland, same thing with Houston, and there's more available space to be able to do that. LA and Long Beach are basically landlocked constrained. There's no empty space in LA and Long Beach, which means that you really are stuck with these containers understand one of the things you have to do in, in i live in north carolina we have north carolina state ports we have an inland port we have a port in charlotte and one of the things we do is take containers out of wilmington out of moorhead city and move them to that inland port and so we're able to do that you see the development of ports in utah in the mojave you know that's what needs to be done the problem is they're outside the municipalities control long beach and la this is a state national issue and yet this is not how we treat ports and cargo operations in the United States. Off ships more efficiently. Other officials have talked about charging ocean carriers for empty containers that spend too long at the port. Just like the ports on the West Coast and particularly in Southern California, there's very little in the short term that they can do to alleviate the problem. For example. So the port of LA in Long Beach has the infamous uh, detention fee they were going to, or, or demerge fee they were going to charge, what I used to call hyper demerge. They were going to charge $100 a day, increasing by $100 per day as a container was left after a set period of time, either a full imported container or an empty container. And they, they threatened to do this back in October of last year. And every week, it's the biggest joke right now. They defer and, and, and don't do it. And a couple of reasons why. Number one, Port of LA and Long Beach made agreements with companies and shippers and ocean carriers that they can keep their containers on the terminal for more than nine days. Back when the terminals were, were slow, that was a really appealing thing. Hey, you can keep your containers here, store them here for free until you need them. So you can ship stuff in early, leave it there for a couple of weeks and then come get it. Well, they had those agreements in place. They couldn't break them. And if they started charging one person for this hyper demerge and not another person, that was going to raise red flags with the Federal Maritime Commission. So they have not 
charge this yet. The other thing is it's a punishment. It's not an incentive. You need to incentivize getting your container. The problem you have now on the West Coast and now emerging on the East and Gulf Coast is warehouses are so full in the interior that there's no room for this goods. And so why pick up your container at the ocean terminal, bring it to your warehouse when you can't unpack it? Because then when you return back, you, you don't have a chassis because the chassis has a container on the back of it that's loaded. And so you can't pick anything up. It creates this. What's amazing to me right now is what happened in L.A. and Long Beach is happening right now in New York, New Jersey, Savannah, Houston. We saw it happening last year, yet we've done very little to prevent it from happening again on the East and Gulf Coast. Bolt dredging channels and installing new cranes. Those kinds of improvements can take years. But she so. What she's talking about is the fact that these ports, Savannah, Houston, New York, New Jersey, particularly, have invested massively to bring these container ships in. Houston right now is in the midst of a billion-dollar dredging project. Savannah just finished a huge, almost billion-dollar dredging project to get the draft down to 50 feet to bring these large container vessels in. New York, New Jersey, massive dredging project, and they had to lift the Bayonne Bridge over a billion dollars so that they can get the ships underneath them. All these ports do all these infrastructure things to bring these container ships in. Ironically, the ocean shippers, the companies that are making the mega profits right now, don't pay into that at all. Shipping officials say a slowdown in cargoes might be on the horizon. Because many importers brought goods in early and because there are significant signs of a slowdown in consumer spending, uh, some of the shipping industry executives and officials that I spoke to said that they expect this year's peak shipping season, which we're currently in the middle of, uh, is expected to be a lot softer than it normally is. So, so I, I have a big problem with that statement right there. Softer than it normally is. OK, we're, we're at record levels right now. We'll be, will we be softer than last year, which was the record year? Yeah, we're coming down Mount Everest, but we're still pretty high. Uh, so. Yes, we're going to see it. If I envision when we're going to see this market change, you know, from, you know, a bull to a bear, uh, you're looking at the end of this year into the spring of next year. So fourth quarter into first quarter next year is what you're going to perceive. However, the problem you have is we keep getting these black swan events that keep resonating through the supply chain. So you've got the Port of Felixstowe just announcing an eight-day strike, ports in Northern Europe and in, in, in Germany announcing strikes. You still have the ling lingering contract renegotiation on the West Coast of the United States. You're seeing all these issues. Plus, on top of this, we're going to see the massive scrapping of container ships here very soon that's going to reduce the supply of vessels out there. Now, there's new vessels coming in in 2023 and 2024 on the horizon that are going to come in. A lot of those vessels are going to be Neo Panamax vessels that can go either route, either to Europe from Asia or swing through the Panama Canal and come to the East and Gulf Coast. So you're going to see a lot of flexibility built into these sh shipping companies, fleets that don't exist right now in some measures. But most importantly of all, it depends on what the economy does and the consumers do. We still don't know what post-COVID economics looks like. E-commerce, the fact that people are at home has changed the consumer buying pattern. Some industry officials are hopeful that in the weeks and months ahead, the amount of congestion will reduce and the bottlenecks will begin to subside, at least a little bit. So overall, I would say that it, it's a good video. I mean, it provides a lot of information there for you. However, they miss some key points. And again, you're trying to keep a four or five minute video. Things have to be left out. But I think those key points that I raised are really important to put into context what the Wall Street Journal is trying to convey there. The how is, is, is fairly straightforward. It's the why. Is, is, I tell my students this all the time. The who, the what, the where, the how, that's easy to find out. It's the why. Why do things happen? Because the why means it can happen again. And as we keep seeing these disruptions, these black swan events happening, they keep causing the supply chain, the global supply chain and ocean shipping to keep rates higher than they were pre-COVID. Yes, we're down from the record levels. We're not at $25,000 spot rates for a container. We're, we're, we're down below 9,000 for uh, containers going from Asia to the East Coast of the United States, down below six going across the Pacific, which is great, but still at a very high level compared to 1,500 to 2,000 prior to COVID. And again, 
one of the things you can expect to see is you see these disruptions take place. And as these ocean carriers begin to blank sail, cancel sailings, they reduce the availability of ocean shipping to move containers. That's going to artificially keep the freight rates up. So there are a lot of factors going in to why we're shifting from the West Coast to the East and Gulf Coast, but yet the West Coast is still jammed. Even though we don't have 100 ships off the coast, we only have a dozen or so, they're still coming in at a fairly consistent level. And even if we didn't have ships waiting, these ships are coming in fully loaded. They're not 75%, 50% like they were pre-COVID. These ships are coming in fully loaded with full loads of 10 to 15,000 boxes on board, which is just overwhelming the interior transportation system, the interior yards, the terminals right there, the road, the rail, the, the warehouses. And as we see issues with class one railways in the United States, issues with trucking, this all feeds into the whole system. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment, share it across social media, give it a thumbs up. And if you can, if you can't, support the channel two ways. One, you hit that super thanks button below and contribute directly to the channel, or you head on over to Patreon. You'll see the link at the very end of the video. Link over there, become a patron. We have different levels that you can join to support the page. That allows me to spend the time and, and research necessary to bring videos like this to you. To our next video, this is Sal, signing off.